Thank you for listening to the following films podcast. Today, I have a special episode with two interviews that I conducted over the course of Fantastic Fest. First up, I have Living with Chucky. This is a documentary feature, uh, which is an ode to a horror franchise and a movie monster icon that's directed by Kyra Elise Gardner, the daughter of one of Chucky's longtime visual effects supervisors. Having grown up with the Chucky doll in her home since childhood, The filmmaker recounts the the behind-the-scenes process of bringing the doll to life, as well as the cultural impact of Chucky and his bloodthirsty family on modern horror. Then, after the break, I'll have King on the screen. This is a film which interviews the lion's share of the filmmakers who have adapted Stephen King's work to screen. It includes interviews with Frank Darabont, Mick Garris, Mike Flanagan, Greg Nicotero, and several more. The film was directed by Daphne Bywear, and King on the Screen is an intimate look at the unique relationship between Stephen King, his vast body of work, and the director's famous for reimagining it for the screen. With an ambitious fictional introduction packed with Easter eggs, references, and other winks that constant readers will find delightful, this doc is a must-see for any Kinghead and casual viewer alike. Want to give a big thanks to Bookman's for sponsoring the show today. Also want to mention that on October 14th at the Bookman's Northwest location, I'll be hosting a true crime uh, trivia night. So if you're into true crime, live in the Tucson area, please go ahead, come out, check it out. I think you'll have a good time with it. Uh, Also want to thank Fort Worth for letting me use the song at the end. Hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. Yes, thank you for interviewing me. Um, I saw Dollhouse a couple years ago, and I think your film, when I saw that, it actually had this really cool thing where it made me realize why I love these films, um, where all the other horror franchises that I had seen, it was like, I would kind of dip in and out. I enjoyed them. I'm a horror guy. But there was something about the Child's Play films that I felt like they got better as they went along. And I just really was connected to them for a reason that I couldn't quite explain to people. And then it's there's no cynicism in it. And it's because it's this family that keeps getting together every couple of years and making this thing. And it was something, an idea of this that I had never explored before. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. I'm glad you got to expand upon that now. Thank you. I'm so happy that you got to see the short. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really good. It's. I mean, I think it's on a couple of the releases now at this point, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just- so those who haven't seen Dollhouse, go back and check it out. But I think that you end up covering... Um, some of the same ground here where it's from the same set of interviews, I believe. And it's just expanded out and does the whole history of the franchise. Is that where this started from in the initial project and you just truncated it down to that one special feature or how did this all come together? Um, Yeah, it was actually a, I went to Florida state university for film school and they're one of the few uh, colleges that have a documentary semester. So that's how this all started was it was intended to just be a short and then um, I had eight hours because I had, I think, like six interviewees, you know, and they had a running time of it could only be seven minutes. And so I had to pack, you know, what I could and down to a very short amount of time. And so it really just folks focused on the family aspect and didn't really cover, you know, the history or anything. Um, and then once that did its festival run and things, everybody was just like, why isn't this a longer thing? What are you doing? And I was like, I, my film school said it could only be seven minutes. Sorry guys, I have to graduate college first. <laughs> um, and so really that's where, so I just took the interviews that I had and expanded upon them and got more people from the franchise, like Jennifer Tilly, Alex Vincent and all those things and, and turned it into the feature that it is now. And then is that, um, is, is documentary where you want to see yourself headed from here? Because I really, I love this film. I think you put together a really strong uh, feature on documentary. Or do you want to move into more narrative stuff or special effects behind the camera and follow in the family tradition? What are you thinking? Um, I definitely want to transition into directing narrative horror that focuses on uh, stories that have practical effects like SFX and things. Uh, because that's kind of the reality that was my childhood was like, anything is possible and can exist. So that's kind of how I tend to write anyhow. Um, You know, my senior thesis was a four foot tall fish puppet at FSU because (laughs) that's what I imagined. And nobody understood it at first. And I was like, I know how we do this. But uh, so it's kind of, yeah, that's what I hope to transition to. If I did do um, documentary again, um, it would probably be within the horror world still or SFX makeup. I Honestly, one day do hope to make a documentary or film about my dad. 
I, I think there's, an, I mean, his body of work and everything. And I, I think that it's, yeah, there's enough there to go into. And I kind of felt that way about the, this franchise itself. There was more than enough just in the films, but you got into the real human story behind it. And that seemed to be the underlying focus of this is the people that made it. And I think that it's just, there's a lot of people like me out there that have that deep connection to this, these goofy, goofy little movies that are just so much fun. And it's because they're made with so much heart. Yeah. And that's what I really wanted to showcase because you don't really get that as much in typical, you know, behind the scenes um, documentary horror things as, as, you know, it's really focused on the monster and stuff and, you know, just the filming aspect, but it's like, no, but what was that like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And the idea that you, you asked this question about, you know, what's it like to be away from your families and people had, it seems like people had never been asked that question before that that was kind of something that was really important to you coming from your experience with your father. But then to have them ask that, it's like, Oh God, that part of it. Yeah. The part that makes the job hard. And that was just really fascinating to see everybody's reaction to that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It touched my heart when David Kirshner was like, nobody's ever asked me that before, you know, and he's been in the industry longer than I've been alive. So I was just like, are you kidding me? Uh, it's uh, it, it's it's one of the, those sides that that's the I generally don't ask a lot about family, personal life kind of things unless it comes up naturally through organic conversation, because I really just am concerned with the work part of it. But that is a big part of the work, like what it takes to make things these things happen, especially when they're, you know, you're doing the series now in Canada or before when they were doing them low budget in Eastern Europe and these things where it's just you're going to be away for a long time from your people, the people that make it worth doing. Yeah, my dad just got back from Toronto season two, and he was gone for six, five, five months. And so, it's just... do you guys still see each other pretty regularly? Or yeah, yeah, um, I see my dad all the time. He was just here a few days ago. Uh, he is as much as I say it in the movie. He's like my best friend. So as much as I can see him, I really do. That's amazing. And can you talk a little bit? I, I'm sorry, this is kind of a side tangent, but I loved Studio Six 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 from earlier this year another like goofy fun and just your idea of working into a narrative feature and working on something like that that has practical effects that's like a perfect fit for what you were looking at doing yeah that's like exactly what I would like to make either where it's more horror comedy because obviously you know the band aren't actors um I mean they definitely are they've done music videos forever but in terms of like an actual movie it's a little bit different um and so things like that, I would like to pursue. And, and that was really interesting because I shot and directed all the behind the scenes of that um, to be made into a documentary. So when you're saying, do you want to do other documentaries? That's kind of another one that I have done, um, but it's, you know, yet to be, you know, edited and put together. But um, yeah, that was a really cool experience getting to see it from very like first inception to the premiere this year. It was so awesome to watch everybody and that's like kind of the thing on those low budget things everybody just puts so much of themselves into it if the people are nice and fun to work with and that's exactly what it was and it's like if you just take that and multiply it by seven I think that's what the child's play franchise is well I I don't think anybody ever intends on making a bad movie it happens along the way but there's something that I think you can't fake and if it's cynical in nature if it's okay we're just putting the part seven thing and we're doing this because well we we need to fill that slot in halloween this year it doesn't you can't you can't fake that i that i think that when there's people are putting their heart into it i feel like it's something that comes through in the screen in a way that's almost intangible but something that you can absolutely react to and i felt that from both sides of this from the films themselves and from your documentary about these films so you've, you've made something really special here that really speaks to the you know, 46 year old guys like me that are out there that have been watching this stuff ever since we were kids that, you know, this is just, uh, and it's a nice, uh, kind of middle piece. Cause I expect this to go on for another 30 years to come probably. <laughs> yeah. So we all die. Yeah. <laughs> um, th- thank you. That means a lot because, you know, as much as it is personal to me, I didn't, um, you know, I was not born before 1988. So oh. I, I don't know what that experience was like to live it and see it in the theaters and this and that and the cultural, imp- like experiencing the cultural impact back in the 80s and 90s. So you saying that who is somebody who did experience that really means a lot to me because that's what I was trying to do is do it justice for the people who have grown up with it longer than I have. Well, I can say this much. Um, I, I remember seeing the first Child's Play in the theater when I was 12 years old. 
And there was this couple that was sitting in front of me and they were just, I remember directly, like, right. There's the, um, the scene when Andy cries and he's in the mental institution or whatever that is. And the, they just looked at each other and like, Oh my God, this kid is so good. And like, just uh-huh. talking about performance and I, that it, I don't, it's still in the back of my head for whatever reason, but I've, seen so many films in the theater so many horror films and movie theaters and i rarely hear somebody talk about performance and that was something that was right there that's a memory that i can go back to from when i was 12 people talking about these films in that way that's so cool well, i'm glad we talked about that scene in the doc yeah. as well so that's perfect yeah i mean it just like it lined up right in that thing and it's and i think that it's just something that it's here um that this is not your average film when you go back to watch that one for me I kind of tend to go, I feel like there's like three waves of these movies now into the series. And it's kind of with the um, Bride On is where I seem seem to be revisiting a lot because I think it just speaks to the weirdo in me a little bit more. Like once Don was able to really insert the counterculture that he made these films as gay as possible, that's when I'm like really all on board. And that's when I'm fully invested. So yeah, I think that it's just uh, so much fun to see those. I love that. Yeah, I wish I wish um, Curse and Colt would have had, you know, theatrical releases, but hopefully, you know, you know, there's screenings that happen from time to time throughout the country. So, but yeah, yeah. for sure. They, they deserve to be seen with an audience. I've never had the chance to see them with an audience yet, but yeah. I would love to. I, I saw the almost with the exception of part three, I saw the rest of them that had theatrical well, the reboot. I don't really count. So, but with the exception of <laughs> we don't talk yeah. about that. <laughs> So I saw the rest of them though, but yeah, it's a, I, I'm big fan and I'm congratulations on getting the screening at fantastic fest. That's huge. I know this is going to be received so warmly and I know people are going to be talking about this film for a while to come. This is going to be one that the people like me, um, yeah, they're going to go nuts for this thing. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind. Oh, no, no, thank you. And thank you for taking the time. And I'm looking forward to whatever else is coming down the pike next. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm, oh, I'm thank board, you. So. Excellent. Uh, hopefully I get the points. <laughs> well, no, 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 please. I'm looking forward to the sophomore slump. I, I hope, you know, and then the, the rebound for the third thing or whatever that is. So, no, I, in fact, if it is Studio 666, a full documentary on that, that's something I would love to dive into. I would love oh to find God. out more I, about that one. So I can't wait for people to see that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and and that's one of those ones I think that, that that'll be a movie that people revisit years to come because that movie's a hell of a lot of fun and there's a lot there so but thank you and congratulations i do appreciate it oh thank you take care you too thank you (laughs) all right thanks emma thanks love take care bye this makes noise this is recording us right now, so we're just going to talk right here, you know? Okay. Today's episode of the Following Films podcast is brought to you by Bookman's. So earlier today, when I went into Bookman's, I was thinking about the conversation I was having earlier today, and I just wanted to check out a movie that maybe was a genre film, but had a little bit more on its mind, something that was a horror film, maybe something that had a political or social commentary underneath it. And when I walked into Bookman's, I happened to come across the 4K edition of Candyman, uh, the one that Scream Factory put out earlier this year, and it's a phenomenal set. I'm really looking forward to watching it tonight. But today I'm joined by my son, Jacob, who had some questions about Candyman, the movie. When he was looking at uh, the Blu-ray cover, he had some questions. So let's kind of go through those right now. So Jacob, come here. Yes. Uh, What is your first question about this Candyman? Um, um, what? What happens if you say you and his name five times? That's a that's a good question because on the bottom of the Blu-ray case it says we dare you to say his name five times. So if you look in a mirror in the movie and you say Candyman five times, Candyman will appear. He'll come there. And you'll kill. Oh well, wow. Um, I, I didn't tell you that, but yeah, that, that's that's what would happen. <laughs> Because this is make-believe, it's not a real thing that happens, this is just a story, it's just pretend. Good, good, good. So Candyman shows up in the room and then lights out. So do you have any other questions about the uh, the Blu-ray case here that you're looking at? Um, why is there a bee right there? Okay, that's a good question. So the bee is there because Candyman, uh, well, what do you think? Well, if you had to, 
If you were going to watch this movie, if you had to think, why would there be a bee there? What do you think is going on in this picture? I think a, he, um, a bee affected him. That's right. He, he was bitten by bees. That's right. Yep. That, that's that's why there's a bee there, because the candy man was bitten by bees. And, and means, so, means, means he would kill the bees that did that? Well, no, not necessarily. But, so do you have any other questions about this on here? Um, why is he in the eye? Oh, that's Candyman. That's just a reflection. So this is, this eyeball right here, it represents, there's a woman who's looking in the mirror, and then she can see Candyman in the mirror also. So I think that's what that's trying to portray. So I have a question for you about this movie. Do you think this is a movie that a kid should watch? No. Is this a movie that you ever think you'll watch? When you're a grown-up, do you ever want to see Candyman? Yes. When you're a grown-up? Okay, cool. As long as it's not too horrifying. It's not that bad. It's a lot of fun. Mom loves this movie. I love this movie, so we're going to probably watch this later tonight. How, wait, but how do you know all this stuff? How do I know all this about it? Well, because I like movies a lot. That's why I have a movie podcast, so that I can talk about movies. And why do you actually know all about what's in this movie? Because I've seen it a bunch of times. Oh, um, the classic one, like part one? Yeah, well, there's actually, there's four Candyman movies. Ooh. There's a uh, three that star Tony Todd, who's that guy right there. He's actually, Tony Todd is a really well-respected genre actor. I like him a lot. In fact, we're connected on Twitter and we end up talking about music a lot. So really nice guy. He's not scary at all, the guy who plays Candyman in real life. And then there was a remake that was done, or I guess it's kind of a sequel to it that was done recently, came out last year that's really, really good, or a couple years now, I guess it's, it's been out for. So yeah, definitely worth checking out. But a new yeah. question. Why is it a point right there? Well, that just makes it a little bit more horrifying. So I think we need to get back to the interview. Why don't you uh, just go ahead and say thank you for listening to the show to the people. Thank you for listening to the show. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy the rest of the show. to do this today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> you as well. I just had a chance to watch the film last night and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, for me personally, one of the highlights were the bookends of the film, where you kind of just throw all these eggs, as, as many as you could possibly fit in this, uh, about, I guess, seven minute time frame between the two uh, segments. I was wondering if you had a particular Easter egg that you put in there that you really, that you enjoyed the most. Because I, I, the one for If It Bleeds for The Life of Chuck was one that I really loved, because that's a story that I really like. But I was wondering if there's one that you really appreciated. I'm sorry, I think the connection lags a little. Uh, could you just <laughs> repeat the question because I didn't get it. So sorry, I have, a, I have a tendency to have, sure, no, I have very long-winded questions, I'm sorry. Um, in the opening of the film, I'm wondering if there was a particular homage or reference that you connected with the most because I, I saw a ton of them and I'm sure there's a ton that I missed. Uh, well, actually, um, one of the, the great Easter eggs that I really loved uh, is the Crip Show doll. <laughs> we had the chance to have uh, the Crip Show uh, that was used on uh, uh, the Crip Show doll that was used on a uh, Crip Show uh, because uh, Greg uh, Nicotero had the kindness to lend it to us. So we built this Crip Show with a lot of Easter eggs in it. And in the window, we have the, the, the doll. And it was like completely surreal to receive from Greg Nicotero, like this package. And we were like, it was almost religious or something. <laughs> when yeah. we opened the box, it was like, oh gosh, this is the, the actual doll. And it was so thrilling to, 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 to put it in the window, to find the right angle, to, to have it very well in the shots. And uh, building this script shop actually, where we put a lot of different references, even in the, the small sentences, uh, it's a script shop, find uh, your needful things since uh, 1976, which is the date of the first uh, Stephen King adaptation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we worked like crazy to have a lot of uh, Easter eggs and at the end we have more like like more than 300 uh, references wow. in, in like 
seven minutes. So yeah, that was <laughs> that was something. And all the actors for sure, because they are Easter eggs as well. Somehow they are references, and working with them. I mean, having Jeffrey Deman on the set, it's like something incredible. Uh, being able to to work with actors like. Jeffrey or Amy Irving or Alexandra Paul or Ed Carroll, uh, Adam Carroll, sorry. Uh, it's like a dream come true, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, I'm, I'm wondering because you're somebody that um, Creepshow has been around your entire life. And so a lot of these works, they predate you by a significant amount of time. So when did you become aware of King's work and what led you to tell, to dedicate, make this film? Well, actually I discovered Stephen King for the first time uh, when I was uh, 10. So it, um, <laughs> the first um, yeah. time I read was The Shining. I wanted to read something very scary and I wanted to have nightmares. So <laughs> I asked my father, okay, I want something very, very, scary so could you please find me something and he loaned me the shining he said okay with this and the funny thing is at the time he was working night shift in a hotel so we were like I was um, going to his workplace sometimes and I was like just walking in the, the hotel the night with Everybody was asleep and it was like kind of leaving the shining on a small scale, but it was very impressive. So it had a great impact on me. And then after I wanted to read everything, so I read all the books. Uh, and uh, after seeing The Shining, my, uh, after reading, sorry, The Shining, my father told me, that, you know, there's a, a movie that was made. I was like, well, there's a movie. So I watched uh, The Shining from Kubrick and actually I was very disappointed because I saw the, the film after reading the book and I was like, oh, this is so much better in the, in the book. And then I started um, reading the books and then watching the films and I thought it was very interesting always to have this kind of um, comparison between the two so yeah that's how uh, I saw Crypto as well well Crypto, it's a little bit I was a little bit older because I thought okay what what's um I was interesting in um uh, interested in uh George uh, Romero's work yeah. actually the dark half and then that's how I came to Crypto. And I discovered crypto and I was like, oh, that's something very different. And uh, it's very interesting and very unusual and not that well known. I mean, for fans, for sure. But people know The Shining. Everybody knows yeah. The Shining. I mean, but crypto, it's like more some kind of outsider Um considering the others and I thought it could be great to have some part of the documentary talking about crypto because it's so great and to perhaps people will see they did this part and will say okay I want to watch crypto which could be great because I think it's so good it's so good crypto I mean it's a, it's, a, it's such a great movie as well I agree. I, I, it's one of my personal favorites. It's one I saw very, very young um, when I was way too young. I think I was about the same age that I saw that, that you saw The Shining. I saw a creep show on HBO in an afternoon and it was just, I was floored by it. It wasn't until years later that I realized it was actually much funnier than I initially thought. The, the, the comedy didn't land with me because I was just scared of the film. Yeah. And just, it's such a wonderful, subversive, strange little movie. And um, I did have a question about the structure of your film though mm -hmm. because it feels like almost like a conversation where you just you're talking about one film and then it brings up this one little thing that heads off on a different little tangent it wasn't structured in necessarily here are the order of the films here are the order of the books we're going through this in a natural it felt very organic the way that it was put together could you talk about the structuring of it and what led to that particular style 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, actually, we had this conversation because we didn't want to have a film that would look like an encyclopedia, you know, having uh, talking about this film, then this film, then this film, because we thought, okay, if we do this, we don't have uh, something, we don't have a structure. We have like showing films one after the other. And it's a shame because we, we don't tell a story down. We, we lose the fact of telling a story through all the movies. So we thought, okay, we have to, to make that story work. And one of the examples that I really liked uh, doing uh, in the documentary was, for example, when we talk about The Shining. And we talk about um, Kubrick's version, and then we talk about how King uh, didn't like it and how Mick Garris did his own. And then... Frank is coming because he's talking about the fact that he went on the set to ask for uh, Steve for the rights for the Green Mile. So <laughs> those kind of things, those kind of connection were very interesting to work um, to work on because we thought, okay, that's that's our direction because it, <laughs> it goes well in in that sense. So it was kind of like. Um, it took a lot of time, for sure, because we had something like 30 hours of footage. Uh, <laughs> like we, we took at least one hour with each director, ex wow. uh, except for Frank Darabont and Nick Garris, where we took like two hours and a half, something like this. So it was a lot of things. And it's always difficult because when you talk to filmmakers who are so passionate about their work uh it's very hard to cut things because everything is interesting so you have to make choices regarding what fits the story you are telling so we we really worked on the structure once the interviews were completed when we had all the transcriptions of the, the interviews and we were like okay now we've got the stories. We knew in advance what kind of... Oh, interesting. Sure I, yeah, I, I had in mind what I wanted to talk about for sure. But we had them in the edit room to do the... Yeah. So it was almost put together like the same way that you would do an oral history, it sounds like, where you would have the transcriptions from the different interviews and you just go down and follow that path that way instead of... That's, that's really interesting. I wouldn't have thought about handling it that way. And, it, and I think that explains why it works that way. And it feels um, like some of those, like the Saturday night of that or something where you have all these different compilations of interviews. So it's a really, really fun piece. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm working on paper at first because it's always easier when you have all the interviews in front of you. You, you can see them and then it's it goes very quickly actually because when you are uh, well it's how I, I worked on this movie actually to 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 put some kind of paper cuts at first and uh, seeing okay oh this could be uh oh, that that that's interesting I want that uh, here and it will work better and and then start uh, from the paper before uh, going uh, on the computer and then <laughs> working really on the on the interviews so yeah that was a uh, um, not always easy to crack because <laughs> there were a lot of things but yeah I think we we did it well. We we managed to 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 pull a, a string to the to the the film, so we were glad at the end. Absolutely, and it's um. I'm hoping that I, I know that you have the festival shows that are coming up for this in the screenings, and I'm I'm very jealous that I'm not going to be seeing this with an audience because I would love to, especially with the horror crowd. To I thought I knew a ton of this information and i did know some of it but there were quite a few little tidbits here and there that i wasn't aware of so there's definitely even the most uh, diehard king fans will find something new in this so congratulations on the film i really enjoyed it it's a wonderful little thing you made here oh thank you so much yeah we we had the, some very exclusive anecdotes that we wanted to put in the film for example the fact that uh, michael Astrom uh, used the shining axe for is seen in 49. Oh, yeah. 
we, we didn't know that and we were like wow that that's amazing that's amazing because he shot uh, at the same location that Kubrick did in mm -hmm. England so it was like oh wow this will definitely go in the film because <laughs> it's like amazing to to yeah i i didn't know and i i, I was like okay thank you so much for, for this little pearl so yeah that was great awesome well i i'm sorry that it's uh going to be a truncated very short interview today but i really did enjoy it and I hope that at some point, if this ever gets a physical media release, you'll consider just putting out all 30 hours of it because I could have dove into this for another, you know, 20 hours, no problem. <laughs> yeah, well, we thought about it, uh, about it because we, we were like, yeah, there are some great things that come, can, cannot be put in the documentary. And we were like, okay, we have to find a solution. So we thought uh, we will do some kind of podcast with um, the full length interviews. Nice. Um, and so we are working on it, but uh, it will take a little, <laughs> some some months before being uh, like a, a thing. But yeah, we, well, it's so great when you are able to talk to those incredible filmmakers for like an hour. So, so it's something that we don't want to throw away like, like this, we really want to, to have uh, the possibility to share the contents, actually. Well, you have you have one subscriber day one right there. I'm on board <laughs> fully, so I'm definitely going to be checking that out. So thank you so much, and That's best great. of luck with it. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Emma. Bye. 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 Time enough to figure you out. Time enough to write this down Wish me luck, give me hope
voice crack.